Hi, everyone, and welcome to the fourth and final part of this very short introduction on partial differential equations. Uh, what have we have seen until now is um, why PDEs are interesting, what types of physics phenomena they model, you know, most importantly, distributed parameters like a temperature distribution. Um, and then we've seen that this raises all sorts of problems. We have um, a distributed and infinite dimensional state space at each point in time. And we have partial derivatives in space, which need to be discretized in order to solve these systems on a computer on a numerical grid. And we have seen in part three, so the previous video, how this can be derived in a rather general fashion. Right? This was a rather technical video where we saw, okay, there is a Taylor series expansion, which allows me to replace the second order derivative by points on consecutive grid points. Right? So let's say we had a grid point J, and then we had a grid point J minus one and a grid point J plus one. And of course this holds for all J in the interior. And we saw, okay, instead of using the second order derivative, we can use a finite difference approximation and then get rid of this and get rid of the T and replace it by a, what we called a T hat, which was defined on this finite number of grid points. And we also saw, okay, if the number of grid points grows larger and larger, this should hopefully converge to the analytical and continuous solution. And this final part is about, you know, making this a little bit more clearer and going all the way using again the example of our favorite equation, the heat equation, right? It's rather simple, it's linear, but still we can see lots of nice things here and um, well, the, the, the concepts can be applied to other systems as well. Maybe numerical details become more challenging, but still this is the overarching idea. Okay, and so here's the system that we are going to solve. I have written these three boxes in blue. You see the PDE as we know it, the heat equation, which is defined uh, for our state S in the domain omega, which is the open interval zero to L, which means the boundary conditions zero and L are not included. And for the interest, uh, the time interval that we're interested in T zero to T end. And then we have an initial condition here in pink, Right, so the temperature distribution S uh, or over state the variable S, space variable, at T0 is some T0 of S. So a distributed temperature in the beginning. And this is the orange box that is, let's say, what distinguishes further PDEs from ODEs. We need boundary conditions. So for S in gamma, in the boundary, which is zero and, um, Oh, excuse me, which is zero and L here. No, it's not a four, <laughs> it's an L. So these two boundaries give me zero and L, which means I have well, the open interval from zero to L, these are the boundaries. And so what we see is that there we need to specify values. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to define the temperature itself. So I'm saying at the left boundary, I have a temperature T left or TL. At the right boundary, I have a temperature TR or T right. So it's, this is what we call a Dirichlet boundary condition, which means we specify the temperature itself. Well, if you're interested in, in learning more about this, we'd, we could also define the derivative. Let's say the temperature gradient at the left or right boundary is given by some value. This would then be Neumann boundary conditions. But this is just a side note. We are going to treat this most simple setting here. Okay? And so this is where we start, and we have learned all about the discretization in space in the last video. So now let's go through this once more, and now specifically for the heat equation. So what have we seen? We have our grid in space consisting of n nodes. And so what we had is we found that this equation, the blue equation here, or in the blue box, can be replaced by an equation for t hat. And so what we have is dt hat j of time t derivative by dt. And now you see, this is not a mistake. I took the regular d because now it's no longer a partial derivative with respect to time, because due to discretization, we have only one independent variable again, right? We have eliminated the spatial dependency by introducing this grid. So it's a regular ODE, right? So this is what we see is we have an ODE due to the discretization in space. So d uh, Tdj is, and this is what something we have seen before, right? We have lambda over ds squared. 
And if you recall from the last video, I made a little bit of a fuss about the first and the last row of this matrix because, remember, this is where we have issues with the boundary conditions that we need to consider explicitly. So now I'm doing it correctly from the beginning. So on the diagonal, I have the minus 2 value. On the off diagonals, I have these minus 1 values. Uh, sorry, these plus 1 values. And then I multiply this with t hat um, of t. Excuse me, the j is not even necessary, right? I started on the last slide by deriving this for each individual node. This would mean tj would mean every row of this. Here I have all the entries at the same time. Now what I said is, um, here obviously something's missing, right? The second order derivative is um, t at j minus 1 minus 2 t at node j plus t at j plus 1. This is what these three indices denote. And so left, so the first point in the interior has as a left neighbor the, the boundary node, not an interior node. So what we need is, we need a second term here, plus, which I'm going to denote by b in the end, so I have the same prefactor, and what I need to consider is the right-hand side term. So the 1 times t0, basically, um, but I need to consider it separately because it's not part of the state space. So what I can do now is, this is my t0 of t, excuse me, my t left of t, and this is the t right of t. And in between I have a lot of zeros. Remember all the rows, second row to second to last row are complete, so I don't need points here. First one is where one point is missing, the boundary node. Last one is where one is missing, the boundary node to the right. And so we see that if I do it like this, then this has the form of A times T hat of time plus this term which I will call B now. Okay. So this is a matrix that I'm going to call A and this is a vector that I'm going to call B. So you see, basically all we have seen before now only um, in the correct way, let's say, treatment of these Dirichlet boundary conditions. As I said, if you consider derivatives at the boundaries, not the values themselves, you need to do some different kind of treatment. But um, this is maybe beyond the scope of this course because we will be interested in data in the end anyway. Um, so we're in the ODE setting. And now comes the second part for our complete scheme. What we need is a discretization in time. Okay, and what we will use here is something we have seen before, it's the explicit Euler scheme, which I denote by E, E, okay? So very simple, this is my T, um, DT, let's use maybe another color, this is now my ODE. And so easy enough, I can use now explicit Euler or other Runge Kutta methods, for, but for our purpose we will use the explicit Euler and we're basically done. So what I'm going to say now is the head, and now the notation becomes a bit fluffy maybe, but what I will use is as the index i is now not the element of this vector, but what I'm considering here is the time step, if you wish. And I'm going to say so the entire vector at time step i plus 1 is the entire vector at time step i. So it's an n-dimensional vector here, it's an n-dimensional vector here, plus delta t times the right-hand side of my system, which is this one, right? So what I have is a times t at time step i plus b. 
And so this should look very familiar. Right? It's the explicit Euler for an ODE. Uh, no, due to the discretization, the T hat is an n-dimensional vector, is no longer a function of space. And so this gives us a full discretization in space and time. And because this was rather abstract and also, let's say, uh, a bit technical, let's say, let's have a look at the Julia code for uh, an example. There it is. Um, and we see, basically, I'm going to walk you through this because this is closely related to the, the equation that we have written here. Okay, so the lambda, which is the, the parameter in front of the, the spatial derivative, is something I'm going to set to 0 0.5, rather arbitrarily. Then I have a domain, which has length L, and a spatial step of 0 0.1, which means I have 101, considering the boundary nodes, uh, points in space. And so the S is now this vector of discrete points in, in space, and N is the number of interior grid points. Right? This is what is important. We have 0 and N plus 1, are the boundary nodes. And so here are the time discretization uh, parameters that I've chosen. I'm going from time 0 to time 10 with a time step of um, 0 0.005, so rather fine in time. And I get this time grid T, which has n entries. And now comes what is important for PDEs. We have the boundary conditions. So the left, the TL that I've defined below here, is 0. And the TR, the right boundary condition, is 1. So you see that I can, you know, I need to consider these boundary conditions and then use them in my scheme in this B vector in the end. Or you will see in the code it's done slightly differently, but you will recognize it, I believe. Okay, so here we have the boundary, the initial condition. So T0 is some Gaussian function over space, and I include at the first entry of T0 my left boundary condition, at the last entry of 0 my right boundary condition. And so to show you how this looks, this is the plot to this. This is my initial temperature distribution, okay? Left boundary condition at 0 is 0. Right boundary condition at one, uh, at, at ten, 10 is 1. And then I have this Gaussian curve in the middle. And so what I need to do is, starting from this initial condition, now derive a time stepper. What I've done, basically, is due to this 101 points in space, I already have my t hat here, because it's, it's discrete. Otherwise, I could not implement it, obviously. And so this is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to use the explicit Euler for this discretization. So what you see in this time box is the T is my entire solution, which has n plus 2 entries in space, and capital N entries over time, so it's a matrix in the end, which for which the first column is my initial condition, T0, and for which at every point in time, I set the first entry in space to the left boundary condition and the last entry to the right boundary condition. So this big matrix is, um, contains the left and right boundary as, a, uh, as, as part of the state space. This is slightly different, what I said, to what we do here. Here I considered for the blue equation only the interior points. Here the T array has the boundary condition inside. Why is this relevant? Because I now have, you know, put the A and B matrices that I've written here, you know, it's here in the bottom right, I've put them together. So the A matrix is n times n plus 2. So, you know, what I did in the beginning, considering this artificial point here and this artificial point here, is what I'm doing in the code now, because the for loop just sets on the diagonal, which now becomes one right of the diagonal, the minus 2 values and left and right the one and one values. So if you go through the code later on, you will see that this is basically, you know, putting A and B together. And if I do it like this, then you see that the explicit Euler, as we have known it before, is just one line of code. But it's only an update rule now for the interior points, you see? So the update of the in points, 2 to n minus 1, so this is points 1 to n in my notation here on the sketch, is the previous value plus dt times a times t, the right-hand side. And you see here, this is the A matrix on my board times the interior points plus the B matrix, which is here on the right-hand side. I've just, you know, included both in the same matrix. And what I get then after plotting the results is over time, and I will, I will show you some, some more plots, but this is for starters maybe interesting to show a few of the details. So we start with this blue curve at t equal, or this is one time step already, but we, it looked similar to this one. And you see that uh, the, the, the solution flattens out over time and you get this constant 
close to constant line in the end. And so this is also something where you can learn a little bit about the physics. Um, we have not talked about this at all yet, we've just seen that this dropped somewhat from the sky. But what you can study here is you see that the time derivative is related to the second order derivative in space. So basically the curvature determines whether in a particular point in space the temperature should grow or shrink. Right? And you see if you look at this blue line at an early point in time here, you see that it's a strong curvature. And you see for instance in the middle where we have a negative curvature, so the second derivative of t with respect to space is negative, it goes down, right? dt by dt, so capital T, time derivative of the temperature, is the temperature is going down because we have a negative curvature in the temperature profile. And on the left here and on the right here, you see that we have a positive curvature, so the temperature goes up. And obviously, a stationary solution in the end is attained when the curvature flattens out. So a constant line has curvature zero everywhere. And this is the stationary solution that we will get in the end. So over time you see this flattening out. We have learned a little bit how these physics, you know, manifest themselves. But since this is in a rather abstract view, let's also look at a few cool animations maybe. Um, what you see here is now a surface plot of the very same solution. What I've done now is not a, a 1D overlay of all them. But you see here I start at time zero and then I progress further in time until 10 seconds and you see the same setting basically as in the, in the 2D plot before, right? We start with this Gaussian curve and then one at the, the right boundary and zero at the left boundary. And then over time, negative curvature means I push it down, the red peak goes down. Positive curvature means I push the temperature up and over time it develops in such a way that we should get a close to flat curve. And now let's see some simulation in motion. So this is a loop, let's wait until it begins. But this is an animation over time, right? So it's close to the end. Now this is where we start. We have strong curvature in the end, so a strong gradient in time. And the flatter the profile gets, the slower this movement becomes, but you see that in the end, well, it's not stationary yet because the curvature is not fully out of the simulation, but you see this will stagnate at a point where we have a linear connection between zero and temperature one, which is also something you might expect if you have a constant cooling and heating at the left and right boundaries of your, of your rod, as we considered in the beginning. Okay, so this is the end of our very short PDE introductory lecture series. I hope that you learned a little bit. Of course, there's lots more to explore, but I think this leaves you well equipped to know a bit about PDEs and also to know what you're doing when we are considering data that was created by PDEs and maybe how to learn about PDEs from data. Thanks for your attention.